Audible Studios presents Hopeless, Book One in the Judgment of the Six series, written by Melissa Hogg and performed by Julie McKay. Chapter One I knew the locations of the people around me as if my head came equipped with a giant fish finder. When I focused, a vast darkness opened in my mind. Instead of blips on a radar, tiny sparks of light shimmered, matching the location of people in the area immediately around me. The colors of the lights, always a yellow center and dark green halo, never varied. Except for me. My spark had a vibrant orange halo, making me unique and alone. Always alone. I stood at the entrance of the park while the bus pulled away with a screech of hydraulics. Dusk had already settled, casting shadows. Before walking my usual path through the park, I opened my senses to make sure it was as deserted as it seemed. Though no sparks decorated the darkness in the area around me, I kept my senses open. The void was endless, but my sight did have a maximum distance. So I monitored the area around me as I walked the path and started thinking of the homework I still needed to do. Distracted, I didn't at first notice the pale blue light with a bright green halo lingering near the pond. There had never been a color variation before. My steps slowed. Perhaps this new color meant I could see something other than humans, maybe animals. As interesting as that would be, the idea of my sight suddenly changing worried me. What if it wasn't an animal? What if it was someone like me? I could keep walking, and whatever the spark was would never know I saw it. But I was too curious and hungry for answers to walk away. I stepped off the path to investigate. The lawn muffled the sound of my approach. Near the edge of the pond, I spotted a shadow moving. It was much too large for an animal. I moved closer. The shadow continued to move, and in an instant I identified the shape. A man. I froze in shock. He stood close to the water's edge. His presence didn't freak me out as much as the lack of the normal yellow-green life spark. In its place shimmered the oddly tinted spark. I'd actually found someone like me. A person who had a uniquely colored life spark. Excitement built even as caution reined me in. What could this odd coloring mean? I'd never run into any variations before. Stay or run? Investigating a color I thought could be an animal was one thing, but approaching a strange man in a dark park? Not the best idea. Yet, my curiosity won. As I edged closer to the grove of trees, I recognized the older man. I bumped into him, literally, a few days ago at the hospital. The man, who had kind brown eyes, a friendly smile, and gray hair, had apologized for bumping into me and continued on his way. That's why I remembered him. Typically, men didn't just continue on their way after seeing me, because along with the ability to see those life sparks, I also had a certain pull. Just on men. From adolescent to grandparent, I unwillingly drew them to me. The degree in which I affected them varied. Some just studied me like a puzzle that needed solving, but forgot about me as soon as I disappeared from sight. For others, I became an obsession. I crept forward as I watched the man sit down and remove his shoes and socks. But I stopped when he began unbuttoning his shirt. What was he doing, stripping down in the park? Given his apparent age, perhaps he suffered from some type of dementia. Maybe he thought it a good place to take a swim? 
When he stepped behind the trees for a moment and re-emerged completely naked, I began to think he might have more serious issues than dementia. Still debating whether I should call out to him, I gasped when his silhouette collapsed. I automatically moved forward, thinking he had fallen. My feet covered some of the distance between us before I saw he had dropped into a low crouch, with his fingers touching the ground. I skidded to a stop so abruptly the grass tore up beneath my feet. His skin rippled like sand in a current. Immobilized, I watched his body contort and fold in on itself in some places, while it stretched in others. What would make him move like that? Was he sick? Something contagious? I couldn't make myself move away. If he was hurt or sick, he needed help. Then, the sounds started. His knuckles cracked and popped, and his thumbs shrank from the rest of his fingers. I took a step back, and then another. Other joints began popping in earnest. It sounded painful. Through it all, he remained silent. My pulse pounded, and I eased another step back. His skull grew larger, longer than it was high, and his nose and mouth extended with it. I forgot to keep moving. His ears shifted higher. A gray down emerged from his exposed skin and grew into thick fur. He shook it out when his slow transformation from human to large canine completed. My mind screamed werewolf, even as it denied the possibility. Werewolves were legend, myth. His head swung in my direction. His eyes glowed eerily from the distant lights. My paralyzing shock left me, and I ran. The park entrance beckoned in the distance but I knew I would never make it. Thanks to my second sight, I saw him rapidly closing in on me. Rather than being attacked from behind, I spun to confront the big gray beast bearing down on me. One well-placed kick to its throat. That's all I needed to get in before it mauled me to death. Yeah, I was going to die. I braced myself. As soon as I turned, the beast slowed to a trot. Within ten feet, it slowed to a walk. My breath still tore through my throat in ragged, terrified gasps. A yard away, it sat on its haunches. I stared at the creature, poised to run again. Intelligent blue eyes watched me. For several long moments, neither of us moved, and a debate raged within me. What did it want? Should I run, or should I wait to find out? Holding its gaze, I slid a foot back. It stood. I froze, heart hammering. The creature began to circle me. I pivoted, following its progress. Finally, we stopped when it had positioned itself between me and the north side of the park. The way home. Then it began to stalk forward, backing me toward the pond. My breathing spiked again. I didn't want to go back to the darker area of the park. Yet I moved backward, fearing what would happen if I didn't. Just as I considered making another run for it, the creature sat down. What was he waiting for? Suddenly, it yipped. The sound scared the breath right out of me. As if that breath had been the signal he'd waited for, he trotted around me to his pile of clothes. There, he morphed back to the man he'd been before. The transformation took less than two heartbeats. Without perversion, I watched him dress, still too stunned and afraid to look away. I thought about running, but couldn't ignore the fact that he and I shared a connection. Unique life sparks. I feared what that meant for me. While buttoning his shirt slowly, he looked up and met my wide gaze. I tried to calm down. Was he like a real canine? 
If he smelled my fear, would he attack? I'd been afraid since he'd changed into his fur, and he hadn't attacked me then, so I supposed he wouldn't now either. My rational thoughts fled when he paced toward me with his hands in the pockets of his khakis. I tensed to bolt. He removed one hand from a pocket and held it up, palm out, signaling I should wait. Right. My name is Samuel Rydell, but calling me Sam suits me just fine. I'm sorry for the scare, but showing you was the only way for you to believe. Believe I'm crazy? Done. It took a few steadying breaths before talking. Why did you show me? What do you want? I fought hard to keep my breathing under control. My mind continued to race. Sam smiled, turned, and walked toward a bench near the edge of the water. He sat and motioned for me to join him. A small noise of disbelief escaped me. He just changed into a dog large enough to pass for a pony. I stayed in the not yet dark shadows of the evergreens. You're different, but not as different as I am, he said, keeping himself turned so he could watch me. He knew something about me? I fidgeted with the strap of my dark brown messenger bag. He could have the answers I needed to explain why I saw the lights in my head, or why men acted so differently around me. The temptation of learning something, anything, rooted me. Yet, there was also the possibility that he knew nothing of my gifts. That what he knew was something completely different from what I already knew. What do you mean I'm different? I decided I had to be sure we were talking about the same thing before I could reveal anything more. You smell different. You're not exactly human, but you're not a werewolf either. Having him say werewolf aloud made everything I'd just witnessed surreal. How could werewolves be possible? How could I be possible? At least... I now knew I wasn't a werewolf like him. I still stood exactly where I'd been, yet I felt like the entire world had just changed while the crickets continued their night song. For clarification, no, I don't need a full moon. No, I don't eat raw meat, although I do enjoy a medium-rare steak on occasion. And no. Silver bullets won't kill me any better than regular ones will. Sam chuckled while he moved over on the bench, making plenty of room and patted the empty space invitingly. You, dear, are not a werewolf, he repeated. I blinked at the absurdity of his invitation to sit with him. What do you want from me? I asked, not bothering to acknowledge his invitation. I still didn't understand why he'd shown me at all. You may not be a werewolf, but you are still special. How old are you? At five feet five inches, with a slight build and few curves to speak of, I looked young. The freckles sprinkling my nose didn't help me look any older, either. Sixteen? I answered absently. How exactly am I special? I shifted my bag to the other shoulder. I was drawn to you. You have a certain scent that calls to my kind. I couldn't name the smell for you other than to say it's interesting, unlike anything else you've ever smelled. Is that why guys don't leave me alone? What if I'd been born with more pheromones than the average person? I'd learned about them in biology. Pheromones attracted the opposite sex. It would explain the pull I had on men and why it had grown stronger as I'd matured. I couldn't pin it on anything about me physically. 
I had straight, shoulder-length, ash-blonde hair, a medium complexion, and hazel eyes like a million other girls. My nose fit my face well enough, neither too wide nor too long, and my mouth wasn't so generous it'd give a guy dirty thoughts. No, it had nothing to do with my looks. Something else pulled them, and I wanted to understand what. Having extra pheromones didn't explain the lights, though. What do you mean? What guys? He sat forward too quickly for my comfort. I flinched back a step and eyed him warily. When he moved like that, he looked a lot younger than his gray hair and weathered skin indicated. So, although he kept his tone light, I remained cautious. Guys under 60 and boys over 10. Well, you're young and pretty, so I'm sure it's not unusual for men to be attracted to you, dear. He settled back with a laugh. He'd said it easily and without inflection, as if he'd made an observation and stated a fact. Reaffirming the pull I had on men didn't seem to affect him. Did that mean he didn't know about my gift and might not understand? Part of me deflated a little. Should I try to explain it? If I smell different to his kind, it might still relate to my gifts. Confiding in him might be worth the risk. Besides, he could hardly run around telling people that I had special abilities when he'd just turned into a wolf in front of me. I took a step closer, partially forgetting caution. No, it's more than that. A boy in school, extremely shy, picked on by jocks to the point of physical cruelty, nudged past those same jocks to wait by my locker to ask me on a date. A man, shopping with two kids, stopped me in the grocery store to ask if I'd consider dating an older man once I turned 18. The 18 bit he threw in after my foster mom gasped in shock. I inched closer, becoming more animated as I spoke, trying to make him understand. When I turned him down, he went back by his kids, red-faced, and told them that he'd just been asking for Grandpa, who wanted to date again. I knew that wasn't true. I paused a moment, then added, Those are just examples of what happens to me every day. Sam studied me for a moment. What's your name, dear? Gabrielle Winters. I prefer Gabby. Well, Gabby, I don't know why men act the way they do around you. But I'd like to help you figure it out. Few people would believe what I've shown you tonight, and I ask that you not try talking anyone into believing. I revealed myself to you because you're special and worth the risk. He stood and approached me, with the pond reflecting dimly behind him and the warm breeze ruffling our hair. I knew that memories of this night would stay with me for a long time. There is so much about werewolves that you need to know. The first is that I'm not the only one. My heart sank. I didn't like the sound of that. I'd like to meet your foster parents, and I'd like to get to know you better. I want to be there for you if you ever need anything. He stuffed his hands into his pockets and rocked back on the heels of his brown laced shoes while I considered his words. You said that I smelled good to your kind. Does that mean I'm going to be run down by other werewolves? The prospect scared me, but I managed to keep any tremor from my voice. It's unlikely, but precisely why I would like to be involved in your life. I can help guide your introduction to our world, so it's not as scary as tonight. He waited quietly while I thought it over. I watched him closely. I liked that he maintained eye contact. 
it was a refreshing change since the majority of conversations with men occurred while they tried to discover visually what about me attracted them. He offered me an opportunity. With his help, maybe I could find out the reason behind my abilities. And given his condition, I felt certain he'd be able to keep my secret if I decided to tell him about the lights. Could I trust him? Not blindly, but I could start small. I'm willing to get to know you better, but I'm not ready for you to meet my foster parents. I wasn't sure if I ever would be. I wanted to protect Tim and Barb Newton from what could be a monster. They were the first set of foster parents I actually liked. But if I wasn't willing to bring him home, then just where would we get to know each other better? Dark nights in the park were out, and I had more brains than to suggest his place. He still scared me. Did I think he was going to hurt me? No. He had plenty of time to try to hurt me tonight and hadn't. But I barely knew the man, so anything was possible. Safety in numbers. Somewhere public. Then I remembered he already knew I volunteered at the hospital thanks to our run-in. Let's meet Wednesday nights at the hospital cafe. Around six? That sounds good. I look forward to seeing you next week. And am truly sorry for scaring you tonight. He held out his hand for a handshake. I looked at him closely and ignored his hand. Instead, I decided to go for blunt. You're not going to turn creepy uncle on me, are you, Sam? I honestly didn't expect him to admit it if he did have that planned. I just wanted to see his reaction to the question. He barked out a laugh and dropped his hand back to his side. When he saw I remained serious, he sobered. I suppose that's a fair question, given what you've just told me. With me, you're safe. Honey, I'm older than I look. Heck, I'm probably old enough to be your great-grandfather. He looked at me for a moment. I mean, really looked at me, studying my face as if he could read all my secrets there. When I look at you, I see a young girl I want to help. I see a grandchild I could have had if only I'd met my one and only. And I see hope. Fair enough. I'd wait until next week to pass any further judgments. All right, then. I've got to get home. See you next week. He nodded his goodbye. Reluctantly, I turned my back on him. Fear skittered along my spine as I walked away. My feet whispered through the grass until I reached the paved walk. When I looked back, he no longer stood by the pond, but I monitored his progress with my other sight as he left the park. My already complicated life had just gotten more so. I took a huge risk meeting with a complete stranger, but how could I refuse? Learning about him and his kind might give me more insight, if not actual answers about my abilities. Abilities that had caused me so much grief over the years. I really wanted an explanation. When I got home, it was later than I thought. Barb and Tim waited for me in the kitchen. They fed me dinner and sat with me at the table while I explained what kept me. I didn't mention a werewolf. Just an old friend of my grandfather's I'd bumped into. I mentioned my plans to meet up with him at the hospital the next week to talk some more. Barb looked at Tim with worry a moment before Tim asked when they'd get to meet him. I asked for their patience and said I wanted to get to know Sam again. First. Three weeks later, I exited the sliding glass hospital doors with Sam. We both eyed the dark clouds. The imminent downpour had cleared the usually bustling sidewalks, but the charged air filled me with anticipation. I turned to Sam. What do you think? Still want to go? We will probably get wet. Sam, 
dressed in his unusually trendy attire for an old guy, continued to study the sky as we walked toward the bus stop. He had been kind and informative during the first two meetings, telling me as much as he could in such a public place about his relatives in the hour I allotted for our meetings. Wary of outsiders, many of his kind chose to live in a closed community across the Canadian border. It had plenty of land, and the rural population of the surrounding area allowed them more space to roam freely. It also had a few old buildings that, up until 20 years ago, had been more for show than living. After the marriage of their leader, things changed. The leader's new wife helped the community see they'd slipped too far from society and that their only chance to survive was to adapt. A few people agreed and left to help reintegrate. A few more stayed in the buildings and started making small improvements. However, several of the structures needed larger scale remodeling and collectively, Sam's relatives just didn't have the money for it. Although remote, a few of the community's members ventured out to find work in nearby towns and supplemented the income needed to support their not yet fully self-sufficient way of life. Gradually, those who denied the need for change started seeing the reality of what they'd become, a dying species. And more of the men not yet married went out looking for work. When the leader's sons were old enough, they too left. Sam had been sent even further from the community to get the lay of the land in a more urban setting. Trying to blend, he decided he needed to dress more like the people of the area. At that point in his narrative, I wondered what he'd been wearing. Furs? When he'd gone shopping, he'd asked a sales clerk's advice regarding what to buy. The sales clerk had been about my age which explained Sam's trendy choice of clothes. It amazed me how much I'd learned about the man walking next to me. The compassion for his people's plight impressed upon me his selflessness, and watching him interact with other people around us showed he had a sense of humor. Those defining characteristics had decided it for me. It was time to introduce him to Tim and Barb. We'd reached the bus stop without a drop of rain. A little rain never hurt anyone, he said, answering my earlier question. Another thing I liked about Sam. He sensed when I was lost in my own thoughts and let me be. Okay, I'll text Barb and let her know you'll be coming over. They've been asking about you every week. He looked at me questioningly. I mentioned you that first night we met in the park. They wanted to know why I was late. I said I ran into an old acquaintance, a friend of my grandfather's. A city bus drew to a halt in front of the sheltered bus stop. Sam and I waited for the other passengers to board. He surprised me by pulling out his own city bus pass to pay. The familiar driver looked at me curiously when I took my normal place behind him and slid over on the worn gray vinyl seat to make room for Sam. Sam and I didn't talk much on the bus ride. Instead, I watched out the window, waiting expectantly for the rain. At our stop, Sam stood and exited. He didn't offer me his hand. After only knowing me a short while, he knew I didn't like to be touched wasn't that I didn't like being touched. I didn't like growing attached. When you touched people, you developed attachments. Then when they left, it made it harder to say goodbye. He waited for me to hop down from the last step, then fell in beside me as we made our way down the paved park path. Although we still had an hour of daylight left, the dark storm clouds writhing in the sky above cast the city into an early dusk. Ever since Sam had revealed himself to me, tension drove me to walk quickly through the park, particularly in the dark. I liked having someone to walk home with me, even if that someone had started the whole thing. In Sam's company, I didn't worry as much. You're certain I won't disrupt things at home just popping in like this? 
I don't think you can disrupt it any more than it's been. I sat. Barb, my foster mom, is pregnant, which really is a good thing. Barb and Tim have been trying to get pregnant for years. Thinking they'd never have kids of their own, they decided to foster. We were halfway across the park. Sam slowed to give me more time to talk. I hadn't mentioned any of this to him before. The swings in the abandoned playground to our right started to sway in the increasing winds, their older chains squeaking slightly with each forward swing. They own a cute little two-bedroom house. If she carries the baby to term, there won't be enough room. You know? I kept my eyes focused on the path, not wanting to see his expression. Because she hasn't yet passed her first term, they haven't notified my social worker. I had no regret. I really did feel happy for Barb and Tim, and I'd moved around enough in foster care to know the drill. Plus, I counted down the days, months, until I turned 18, legally free from anyone's guardianship. Sam remained silent beside me. Leaving the park, we turned right on the sidewalk. The phone in my bag buzzed, and I quickly searched for it. The rain still held back, but the sky overhead rumbled ominously. I checked the message and smiled at Sam. Barb said she's very excited to meet you, and since you and I just ate, they'll have cake and coffee ready. Sam nodded. A fat raindrop splattered on the sidewalk in front of us, and without a word, we both started walking faster. When we turned the last suburban corner, I pointed out the Newton's house to him, not pausing the brisk pace we'd set. Barb and Tim both waited for us on the front stoop. Tim had his arm wrapped around Barb's shoulders as he peeked around the awning to look up at the clouds. When Barb nudged him to point us out, he looked our way and waved. They greeted Sam enthusiastically and invited him in. I could see Barb sizing him up and finding him acceptable. In a rare twist, Tim did most of the talking that night and asked Sam about himself. When Sam said he originally hailed from Canada and managed the family business investments, I figured he stuck as close to the truth as possible. They did ask him about my grandpa, and he wove a beautiful tale about them growing up together. Since I never talked about my grandfather, the Newtons didn't know any differently. The skill with which Sam lied made me a little uncomfortable. If he could lie that easily to them, how easily could he lie to me? The rain stopped before he finished his second cup of coffee. Sam stood and smiled at Barb. The cake and coffee were wonderful. Thank you for letting me drop in like this. He extended a hand to Tim. I won't overstay my welcome or the coffee. Tim clasped Sam's hand with a warm smile as the adults all laughed. It was a pleasure to meet both of you. We appreciated you stopping in. Barb said, already collecting the cups to bring to the sink. When Gabby said she ran into you, we were both very curious. I can imagine. Now that I've found her, I don't want to lose track of her. If it's all right, I'd like to stop by now and again to check in on her. We insist you do. Tim patted Sam's back in a manly display of affection as they walked to the front door. I quickly helped Barb put the dishes in the sink so she could follow them. Barb was a little compulsive and couldn't walk away from a dirty kitchen. What about dinner next Wednesday? Barb asked, raising her voice from the kitchen as she washed and dried her hands at the sink. She hurried to the front door where Sam bent to put on his shoes. That sounds like a good idea. Sam finished tying his shoes and turned to me. Is that okay, Gabby? Leaning against the arch dividing the living room and the kitchen, I watched the adults interact. In a way, it reminded me of the animal channel.
I struggled not to crack a smile at the thought, since Sam really did have one foot in the animal world. After I finish volunteering at the hospital, it should work for me. Satisfied they would see each other soon, the adults said their goodbyes, and Sam left. Not bad for a first meeting. Each time I met with Sam, I learned more about his world. Nothing that I could apply to myself yet. I still had hope, though. Sam visited periodically over the next two months, and life continued as normal for a while. Barb started to show, and the normally reserved Tim couldn't stop talking about it. My time with the Newtons ticked away like the seconds of a clock. On one of our scheduled Wednesday nights, I opened the door for Sam as soon as he knocked. He didn't show any surprise when I swung the door open after just one knock, but then I didn't expect him to. Despite meeting at my home where we couldn't speak freely, I'd managed to learn a little more about him and his kind. For example, he had exceptional hearing. He knew when I got nervous or upset by the change in my pulse. He could hear whispered conversations taking place in other rooms as long as the door remained partially open. He could even hear whispers through thin walls. In addition to keen hearing, he also had better eyesight. In the dark, his pupils expanded to a freakish dimension, allowing in as much light as possible and enabling him to see when a normal person couldn't. This explained the way his eyes reflected. Hi, Sam. I stopped him from taking off his shoes. We're eating on the patio since it's nice out. He wiped his feet extra well on the rug before following me through the house to the back patio. The solid concrete slab patio took up a fourth of their backyard space. The patio wasn't that big. The yard was just that small. But surrounded with a classic wooden privacy fence, it would make a perfect play area. We walked onto the patio, and Tim looked up from the grill to our left and nodded a greeting. Smoke drifted lazily upward as he flipped a burger. Sam, thanks for coming. Barb stopped setting the table and moved to greet Sam with a hug. Sam gave one back with a smile. She long ago stopped trying to hug me. Tim brought the burgers from the grill, and we all sat to eat while Tim and Sam dominated the conversation with fishing stories. When Sam asked if I'd ever been fishing, I nearly choked on my bite of burger. No, I said definitively. He put on a mock, shocked face. How can a girl your age never have been fishing? Many have tried, and all have failed, Sam, I said, slightly amused. I'm not an outdoorsy type. His next comment wiped the smile from Barb's face. You should come with me for the weekend. I'll take you to the cabin your grandpa and I went to before you were even born. It has indoor plumbing now, so I bet you could talk a friend into coming with. I glanced at all the faces at the table. Sam still smiled. Barb focused on me with an alarmed expression, and Tim glanced between me, Barb, and Sam. I took another bite of burger to stall. In private, Sam had asked about my plans for the future. Barb's baby bump was hard to miss now. He had mentioned he had a spare room at his place if I ever needed it. He'd also mentioned he would like to take me on a trip to meet others of his kind. I felt fairly certain that's what he meant now. Having him ask tonight without any warning took me off guard. I could have done some prep work, like dropping hints that I had an interest in spending more time with him or something. But it did make sense that he asked now. Why try to delay the inevitable? The doctors saw no reason Barb's pregnancy wouldn't go full term this time. School would let out soon, and I had no summer job. Setting down my fork, I picked up my glass and took a long drink of water. They all waited. I decided to save the adults the long dance around a subject none of them wanted to face full on. 
I turned toward Barb and Tim. I've spent a lot of time getting to know Sam over the last two months and told him about the baby on the way. I looked at Barb, meeting her beautiful dark brown eyes. We all know that I won't be able to stay once the baby's here. Barb started to tear up and speak, but I stopped her with a raised hand. I also know that you want me to stay. I don't doubt that for a minute. You've both been so great to me, and I thank you. I turned to Sam. You said that you live in a three-bedroom house and that I was welcome to visit any time. What about visiting until I graduate? I didn't want to go back into foster care. Sam continued to smile at me and nod it. Barb started to sniffle, and Tim reached over the table to pat her hand. Chapter 2 Friday night, Barb and Tim dropped me off at Sam's. Though it was only for a weekend, they knew what it would mean if everything went well. So I willfully squashed my discomfort and endured Barb's hug. Tim, thankfully, settled on a nod and a wave as I climbed into Sam's truck. I used the eight-hour drive to ask Sam direct questions about werewolf life and tried to soak up everything he said. I stopped talking when we turned off the black-topped road onto a deeply rutted dirt lane I doubted saw much use. For a mile, I braced myself against the rough ride. Finally, we emerged from the tree-lined path into a wide clearing. A large, two-story log cabin-style structure dominated the space, its wings branching out to connect to outlying buildings. Sam parked on the combination of old gravel, stubborn grass, and plain dirt in front of the buildings. The werewolf community reminded me of an old wilderness resort, one closed for a few years. If not for the lights pouring from several of the windows, I would have locked the truck door instead of getting out. I shouldered my bag and trailed Sam onto the covered porch. Sam pulled the solid wood door open without knocking. Inside, an eclectic array of rugs along the perimeter of the large main entry accommodated numerous sets of shoes. Hooks on the walls held a bounty of coats, jackets, and overalls. We don't have to worry about stealing here, Sam said when he caught me looking at the mass of shoes. And it keeps the rest of the place cleaner if we leave our outside things here. He started taking off his shoes, and I bent to remove mine. You would not believe how messy this place was thirty years ago, a voice called from the hall. I looked up from untying my shoes. A tall woman with blonde hair and a gentle smile walked into the entry. I estimated her to be in her late twenties. Hello, Gabby, she said, coming to stand next to me. I'm Charlene. Sam's told me about you. I'm so thrilled to meet another person like me. She held out her hand in greeting as I stepped out of my shoes. Excitement coursed through me. Finally! Sam had mentioned Charlene, another human among the werewolves, during one of our many talks. The possibility that I wasn't as alone as I thought obliterated any hesitation I might have had and I reached out and clasped her hand. Charlene's grip was firm and sure, but I barely noticed it. The darkness of my other sight had burst open, and the brilliance of the spark surprised me. Their normal, soft glow amplified so much that the blinding light obscured their gentle colors. I let go of her hand while maintaining my focus. The lights dimmed considerably, so I could again discern their soft colors. Sam's spark glowed blue, with a green halo, and hers, while still containing the yellow center like any human, had a red halo. I'd considered the possibility that my orange halo was because I couldn't see myself correctly using my other sight. But seeing Charlene's assured me our uniqueness was real. 
beyond our sparks, I noticed other blue-green lights. Not in the immediate area, but spread throughout my area of awareness. The coloring of those lights matched Sam's. Werewolves, then, were blue-green, I thought. Color by species made sense, but Charlene and I didn't match. Why? Like me? Her words suddenly penetrated my study of the sparks. Could she see lights, too? So far, we are the only two humans who seem to be compatible with werewolves, she said, still smiling in welcome. My hope sank. So we were human, and... Wait, what? Compatible? I looked at Sam in confusion. I knew that I smelled differently to werewolves, but he hadn't mentioned anything about compatibility. Charlene answered before he could. Yes, werewolves choose their mate, husband or wife, instinctually. They have no history of ever before selecting from humans for their mates, but here we are. Whatever it takes to become a mate, we apparently have it too. My mouth popped open in shock as I understood. I turned on Sam. You brought me here to hook up with a werewolf? No, Gabby. I apologize for upsetting you, Charlene said from behind me. I turned to look at her. Yes, we're different in that a werewolf might choose us. But that doesn't mean that they must choose us or that we have to choose them. At your age, there will be no hooking up. She looped her arm through mine and gave me a motherly pat. As soon as she touched me, all the sparks around us brightened again. I didn't even need to focus. The lights just flared and continued to glow brightly without effort. Weird. She led me toward the hall from which she'd entered. After a few steps, she stumbled and pulled her arm from mine. With relief, the lights in my mind extinguished, and I concentrated on her words. I asked Sam to bring you so you and I can talk. As I said, there is no one else like us that we've found. I came here when I was younger than you. Long story, and met Thomas, the PAX leader. It was a very hard adjustment with a huge learning curve on both our sides. I don't want you to have to face any of that on your own. We'll introduce you slowly to this new world you're a part of. If you have any questions, don't be afraid to ask them. She led us down a second hallway and stopped in front of a closed door. When she opened it, I saw it led into a very small apartment. This is still a work in progress. Let me know if you need anything, she said, looking at Sam. He nodded. I took a moment to take in my surroundings as Charlene walked away. The small main room had only a few mismatched pieces of furniture. The bedroom, which I suspected had once been a walk-in closet, barely held a twin-sized bed, nightstand, and lamp. Sam insisted I take that room, as he set his bag on the fold-out couch. I didn't complain. I figured sleeping in a half-sized bed ranked higher than Sam's sleeper sofa. A tiny bathroom right off the main living area completed the suite. The apartment definitely qualified as rustic. But I didn't mind. Sam woke me after a few hours of sleep. Despite Charlene's assurances that my stay didn't include finding a boyfriend, I still felt leery over Sam not telling me about the compatibility thing. I'd thought I could trust him, and his omission stung a little. I wanted to excuse it. Maybe it had slipped his mind, but it had taken eight hours to get here. Granted, most of that time we'd talked about the progress the community had made and the customs like pack hunts, that they no longer followed. Still, he could have mentioned that doozy. By the way, Gabby, werewolves will want you as their mate. I paused, then shook my head at the thought. Yeah, I would have reached for the door handle and tried to jump from the moving truck. 
Maybe he'd made an okay call. Only time would tell. I got out of bed and dressed. Sam already had his bed made when I opened my door. We left the apartment, and he led me to a large room, which he referred to as the Commons, to get a bite to eat. The space served as a cafeteria and an entertainment area, with sitting arrangements scattered around the room. It even had a pool table set in the back corner. Charlene saw us and came over to our table. Two young men followed in her wake. She introduced them as Paul and Henry. She thought I might like the opportunity to talk to people my own age. She even suggested we go into the woods so they could show me more about the werewolf way of life. Sam heard my panicked heartbeat, and before I could refuse, he suggested we use the lounge in the commons to get to know each other instead. Paul and Henry didn't treat me the same as human boys did. As curious about me as I was them, they asked a myriad of questions. What's school like? Paul, the boy with dark hair and a carefree smile, asked while sitting on a padded dish chair close to me. You don't go to school? I couldn't believe it. Nah, said Henry, a short, stocky kid with bright blue eyes. We're homeschooled here. It's way quicker to graduate since we can study at an accelerated pace, because we don't have to break for holidays or anything. That actually sounds pretty great. What school should be, minus the no-breaks part. I cringed inwardly at the thought of school year-round, then answered his original question. The majority of the teachers spend their time hating their jobs and finding ways to be as disagreeable as possible, while the students look at it as a popularity contest and spend more time worrying about who's dating who than studying. I explained. Date? Paul glanced at Henry, who wore an equally puzzled expression. I heard Charlene talking about that once. Sounds weird. Really? You guys don't date? I didn't ask what they did to get to know a girl instead of dating. No, we get invited to introductions, Paul said as if reading my mind. What's that? Sam hadn't mentioned anything like that to me, and I wondered if I should add it to his list of omissions. When a female comes of age, she's brought to the introduction room where she can meet werewolves she has never met before. The elders are there to make sure the girl is safe and to give the guys a few minutes to talk to her. You know, to really get her scent. When there's a connection, a guy just knows and claims her. If not, the next group comes in for their chance. I started to sweat as I sat there. First, what did he mean by claim? Second, they kept a girl in a room while guys came in to look her over and smell her? I reached for my water that sat on the coffee table in the center of our sitting arrangement. My hands shook a little, and I tried really hard to calm down and not let my imagination run away. Hey, Gabby, you okay? Did Paul say something wrong? Charlene said we could ask any questions we wanted. They had no idea how foreign what they just said sounded to me. Hey, Gabby, you don't have to worry about introductions if that's what's scaring you. Paul looked at me with concern. For you and Charlene, the attraction works different. She explained it to us when she said that you were coming. You guys have a level of appeal or chemistry with just about all werewolves is not helping, I thought, while he continued. Because the level of attraction to you varies, it wouldn't be safe to put you in an introduction room. Yeah, Henry agreed, and with a spark of excitement in his eyes, leaned forward in his chair. That's when the mating duels happen. It's rare with a werewolf couple, but when Charlene was first brought here, I heard the guys went crazy because they didn't know what was happening. They fought over who had the strongest tie to her. But you don't have to worry about that with us. Paul and I think you're okay, and you smell good and everything, but we knew when we met you that you're not right for either of us. 
That's why Charlene left you alone with us. My stomach churned. Werewolves were going to start fighting each other for me? No thanks. They both smiled at me encouragingly. They probably thought their explanations helpful, but the information they threw at me stunned me. What did you mean by claim? My voice came out light and airy with anxiety, but I needed to know. It's when we bite our mate. The bite draws blood, but doesn't hurt. Paul explained reassuringly. What? I nearly shouted. My freakometer bypassed meltdown. My head spun dizzily, and no doubt all the color had drained from my face. Oh, not for you, Gabby, Paul said, quickly leaning forward. He made shushing motions with his hands. We can't claim humans like that. When your mate finds you, it's up to you to claim him. So, I would need to bite someone. Not going to happen. It was easier to calm down now that I knew I had control. I didn't want to be the right one for anyone at this point in my life. I hoped that the rest of the werewolves, like these two, would correctly use their keen sense of smell to determine my unsuitability. I heard the main door swing open and saw Sam walk in with an older woman and another older man. Sam nodded to me and then moved with his group to another area of the room. They sat down and started talking. Paul and Henry shifted their attention to the new people, listening. I couldn't hear the conversation, but had no doubt they could. Just as I knew Sam would hear if I asked either Paul or Henry to tell me what the group said, I decided to change the subject. What about sports? I notice there are no TVs. Do you guys play or go watch any sports? Nah, we don't get good reception out here and the television tends to hurt our ears, but we do like to play football. There aren't enough of us for a team, though. The door behind us opened again, and I watched two younger men, about our age, enter. They glanced our way, but headed toward the group with Sam. I turned around and took another drink of water while thinking about this mate business. According to these two, I needed to watch for a werewolf who acted as most human men would toward me. Intense and weird. Sam startled me out of my thoughts when he spoke next to me. Gabby, I'd like you to meet Eric and Derek. They are the twin sons of a couple who lives here. They're home from college and have to leave again tomorrow. I smiled and said hello. They both nodded to me, but didn't speak. Awkward. Uncomfortable, I looked back at Sam, who nodded at the two. They turned and left. If they represented the normal reaction to me, I needed to watch out for someone even more intense and weird. Maybe I just needed a plan to avoid them all. Sam waited until they'd walked out of the room to explain. I want you to get to know the people who live here. In summer, we'll spend a lot of our weekends here. He looked at Paul and Henry. You two keep an eye on her. I'm counting on you to help explain our ways. Sam walked back to the group, and I looked from Paul to Henry with an arched eyebrow. Was it just me, or did that feel weird? I wanted to ask, but remained quiet. There were still too many ears to overhear. They seemed to understand my unspoken question and both shrugged in return. Sam interrupted our conversation twice more, each time bringing someone to introduce to me. My mind caught on to the word, introduce. Paul and Henry's assurance that I would never face the introduction room clicked everything into place. Sam had started slowly introducing me to the eligible male population of this little community right here, right now, in this room. After the third set left, I caught Sam's eye. Sam, would you mind showing me around outside for a bit? I stood and made my way to the main door, not waiting to see if Sam followed. 
After three months, I'd felt sure enough of Sam that I'd risked a trip to an unknown destination with him alone. I'd been willing to explain away the little doozy he didn't mention on the way here. But now, his actions and omissions devastated my confidence in him. Already familiar with the layout of the compound, I didn't hesitate to walk out the front door and stride purposefully toward the dirt lane. Sam didn't take long to catch up to me. If I told him I wanted to go back to the Newtons now, would he take me? If he did, then what? I couldn't stay there forever. Sam, I said when we walked side by side. I don't want to be on the streets, but that's where I'll go if you think you can pull this crap if I move in with you. I didn't look at him. I was too angry and scared. I understand the condition of living at your place is that we come up here. But my condition is that you have to be completely honest about our purpose in coming up here. Each time, I stressed. I don't know if I can trust you. I'm sorry, Gabby. You can trust me. I have your best interests in mind. This is another one of those things that is easier to believe when you experience it firsthand. He kept pace next to me as I led us further from the compound. No, Sam. You need to lay it out for me straight. He stayed quiet for a few minutes, and I wasn't sure he had anything to say until he actually spoke. Well, I heard what Paul and Henry told you. That part's right. We do introductions for our females in a controlled environment to keep them safe until they find their mate. We learned from Charlene's time here that you'd need to be handled differently. I told you that werewolves would find your scent interesting. Since we're branching out into more urban areas, it would only be a matter of time before you attracted attention. So. We wanted to control your introduction. A formal introduction without mass challenges was out of the question. This is the compromise. They come into the commons, say hello to you, then talk to the elders. Because the level of attraction varies, we interview them. They must formally request permission from me to come see you again if they think of you as more than just interesting. They are not allowed to approach you while you are on your own. If they were to approach me for a second meeting, I would speak with you first before approving or denying their request. The light filtering through the canopy cast the road into dusky shadow. I stopped walking and turned to Sam. What you're saying is, eventually werewolves would find me. But if I stay with you... You'd be my buffer? He nodded. I studied him. And I'd only have to say hi to these guys. It'd be up to me if I wanted to spend any additional time with them. He nodded again. I liked Paul and Henry. They oozed useful information and didn't react to me at all. The others I'd already met hadn't seemed too interested either. When Paul and Henry had mentioned mating duels, I imagined drowning in a writhing mass of hostile bodies in all various stages of transformation. I still dreamt about Sam shifting. The dreams and my fueled imagination bothered me. But since arriving, everyone had remained in human form and nothing freaky had happened. The general population of werewolves couldn't be all bad. I just didn't like the way I had to meet them. Yet, now that the werewolves knew I existed, trying to live on my own didn't sound like a good idea. I'd be better off with Sam. He'd keep the others away. Fine. Let's go back. Paul and Henry were playing cards while they ate their way through a stack of sandwiches set out on the coffee table. They waved me over, and I gladly joined their game and grabbed a sandwich for myself. Several more werewolves came in throughout the day. Sam led each one to me. 
Most left after a polite nod of hello. A few asked for a second meeting. Each time, Sam would look at me and, at the shake of my head, reject the request. It relieved me to see him keep his word and restored some of my shaken confidence in him. We packed up and left Sunday morning. I mostly paid attention to the scenery since I'd missed the majority of it on the way there. While I watched the trees flash by, I thought about the weekend. None of the guys I'd met seemed too upset over any type of rejection. For as much emphasis as they'd put on my smelling good to just about all werewolves, their laid-back attitude didn't make much sense to me. Why did the guys seem okay with their second request being rejected? Although you smelled good to them, they knew it wasn't just right. When it is, they won't give up. Which is why staying with me is so important. We have laws that control certain aspects of the social side of the pack. One is that unmated human females, like you, cannot be approached without the approval of the nearest elder. Then why can't you just tell them all no for me in advance, so we don't have to mess with this whole introduction thing? Because I have to give them the chance to see for themselves that it's not right. Was it that bad? Meeting people? No one treated you the way some human men have treated you. I couldn't disagree. How often is this going to happen? Once a month. I sat up straighter. No way! I shook my head for emphasis. It was a cool enough place, but 16 hours of driving in a single weekend every month would get boring. Once every two months. Every five weeks, with flexibility to switch weeks if needed, he said. Seven weeks. Six, he said with a sideways glance at me. Fine, every six weeks, I compromised. Then I threw in another condition. Until I graduate. Then I'm going to college and won't be obligated to take time out of studying for dating or whatever you want to call this, if I don't want to. Deal. He agreed. I stared at him. He'd agreed too easily. Was that a hint of a smile on his mouth? Why did I feel like I just got the raw end of the deal? I'd have to play my cards carefully, so I didn't find myself hitched in some weird backwoods werewolf custom. Chapter 3 Sam sat at the worn oak table in the middle of our sunlit kitchen. He scowled at its dull surface, and when I walked into the room, he transferred the glum look to me. I shook my head at him and went to make his morning coffee. Sam and mornings didn't mesh well. I'd realized that as soon as I'd moved in. How a werewolf, usually graceful and strong, could stumble and mumble until he had his caffeine still confused me. With his werewolf metabolism, I doubted it really did anything for him. Regardless, I still took pity on him and tried to wake up first to start a pot, even though it wasn't my drink of preference in the morning. Today, however, his familiar morning scowl didn't solely relate to his need for coffee. After two years of almost monthly visits to the Canadian werewolf community, this weekend would be my last. And he didn't like it. Happily, I hadn't met a single werewolf who had any type of pull on me. The way I figured it, I'd fulfilled my end of our deal. Though school had scheduled graduation for Sunday, I'd opted not to attend. I had no desire to put this visit off for another week. The faculty could mail my diploma. After this weekend, I planned to work as much as possible to save up what I could before going off to college. I measured out the coffee grounds and reflected back on my time with Sam. I'd kept him company, and his mere presence had kept me safe, 
while he'd provided me with the information I needed about the werewolves and the Pat community. Although Sam had shared so much of the werewolves' life and culture, I acknowledged I still didn't know everything. It didn't matter, though. I'd learned enough, and not just about werewolves. Sam was a great role model for responsibility and planning. It's what he did for the pack. Because of him, I already worked as much as I could after school. But it wasn't just his example that pushed me to become so dedicated to work and financial responsibility. Shortly after I moved in with Sam, I discovered that work commitments ensured he couldn't talk me into going to the compound more than we'd bargained. He knew I'd need the means to get an education and support myself and never tried to talk me out of working. So, I worked, and I tried to bank enough money to hold me over while I went to school. As an elder of the pack, Sam was extremely down-to-earth and wise. He carefully thought through all decisions with a deliberate calm that I admired. He didn't think of himself when making any decision. Only of the pack. Their welfare ruled his life. Thankfully, even though he hadn't managed to tie me to anyone, he considered me part of the pack. That meant when I talked, he listened with his full attention, which I really did like. Coffee brewing, I leaned against the counter and openly smirked at Sam. Come on, don't be pouty about this. We made a deal and I stuck to it. I've met more man dogs than I can remember. Some even twice. My made-up term seemed to amuse him. I pushed away from the counter and walked behind his chair. Resting my forearms on his shoulders, I rolled them outward and pressed down with my full weight. The tension slowly left his shoulders, and I rested my chin on his head. Yeah, I was that short compared to him. Tell me you're going to be okay without me here. I couldn't remember my real grandpa, but over the last two years, Sam had filled that role well, despite our rough start. I knew he had managed his own coffee in the morning for years before I'd moved in with him, but I still wondered what he'd do without me here to keep him company. He sighed gustily and reached back to pat my cheek, the extent of affection I allowed with him. It had been a gradual progress to work up to it. He knew most physical contact made me uncomfortable. He understood it and never seemed offended by it. I'd held myself away from people for so long, I wasn't sure I'd ever be completely comfortable with casually touching anyone. You know I will, he said, sounding tired. I don't understand why you won't go to the community college here. Out of state is so expensive. No, it won't be, I said, pulling away from him. I have scholarships and aid because of being a foster. I made my way to the coffee. A warm breeze brushed past the kitchen curtains to swirl around the room. As I poured him a cup, I continued defending my choice. Besides, you know very well why I'm going out of state. It was an old argument. My place in pack society, forever the bachelorette, bothered me. I wanted out. No other female went through such a long introduction period. Over the last two years, I'd become the one all the guys wanted to meet and hoped to claim by the end of the weekend. Though they treated me with kind hopefulness, my attitude toward finding a mate hadn't changed. I didn't want one. Besides, two years of being the family disappointment was enough. I want my own life before someone else tries to take it over. Sam, I've always had to follow other people's rules. I want to live by my own rules for a while. Sam harumphed. What rules have I ever enforced on you? I gave him a steady look as I handed him the steaming cup. Besides insisting on the introductions? 
He dropped his gaze to the proffered cup and accepted it with a lack of enthusiasm. Not meeting my eyes, he blew on the brew and turned the cup in a circle on the table before he began to sip it slowly. Suspicious, I continued to study his face as I waited for him to look up again. He seemed unexpectedly guilty for such an innocent remark. Though I chafed at his rules, they were simple enough. Go to the introductions. Spend the weekends getting to know the pack and the pack laws. Never stay out past dark without a way to get home. Which meant a ride from Sam, since owning my own car made him uncomfortable. How could he not see he completely controlled my life with those rules? Though I understood the reason for the restriction, it didn't make them more palatable. The very real draw men felt when near me had only grown stronger as I'd matured. It made time alone risky. Sam had insisted I take self-defense classes. Those had been great, until the instructor suggested one-on-one -on -one training sessions a bit too loudly in class. Before I bailed on the course, I'd learned enough to keep men at bay. But not werewolves. Despite knowing I had no protection against them other than Sam, I still wanted to try it out on my own. Sam's rules were simple. However, they weren't mine. It won't be safe. Sam said, interrupting my thoughts. He looked up from his half-empty cup. You know it won't be safe. Sam, I'll get a dog. I could see by his expression that he was gearing up for another round in an old debate. Why couldn't he understand that I'd rather get a dog than be mated to a werewolf? I hurried around him for the bathroom down the hall. I better go shower. We don't want to keep the wolves waiting. I spun into the bathroom and shut the door with a snick to stop any further objections. Just before dinner time, I pushed open the door of Sam's old pickup and, ignoring its groan of protest, climbed out. My feet crunched on the gravel parking area. Not much had changed, though still run down and in need of repairs. To me, the familiar buildings exuded welcome. With a twinge, I realized I'd probably miss these frequent visits. I pushed the door closed, reached around to the bed of the truck, and grabbed my canvas bag. They're a pack meeting tonight, I asked Sam, looking at the other vehicles. I couldn't remember ever seeing so many cars before. Yet, for the number parked in the yard... The compound was unusually quiet. Typically, before a meeting, groups of people stood outside to talk and renew acquaintances. I glanced at the buildings again. Though quiet outside, thin lines of light escaped from behind thick curtains in many of the windows on the main house. Definitely a full house tonight. But why stay inside? Sam just grunted in response to my question, shouldered his own bag, and headed toward the main building. I studied Sam's back. He certainly seemed rushed. He'd even sped, so we arrived in just over seven hours. We'd only stopped once for a five-minute gas-up, eat, and pee break. I hadn't questioned why, but it was unusual. He'd stayed abnormally silent and pensive the entire trip, too. I didn't mind the quiet, but he generally updated me on current pack activity during the drive. Bored, I'd alternated between listening to my MP3 player and watching the country pass in silence. I turned a slow circle, studying the area while I breathed deeply and began to focus. In two years, the area of my sight had expanded so I could see much further in the vast darkness of my mind. It didn't exhaust me as quickly as it used to. I closed my eyes and continued to turn a slow circle. At the compound, focusing was harder. Typically, for humans, some sparks came in strong and glowed bright like a newly replaced light bulb, while others were weak more like a lightning bug's glow. 
I didn't know why, it just was. The lights of the werewolves were different. Their sparks tended to flash in and out of focus, regardless of how bright or dim I perceived them. I considered the flashing a false perception. Instead, I believed I was watching the amazing speed at which they moved. There, one second, gone the next, then back again. Since I hadn't yet shared my ability with Sam, I couldn't confirm my suspicion. In the darkness behind my closed eyes, I saw the usual flashes of light. But they jumped around in a pattern that made me dizzy. I could see flashes in the compound, and many more in the surrounding woods and beyond. I stopped turning before I made myself lightheaded. When I opened my eyes, I faced the woods to the right of the compound, just inside the gate. I felt watched. Not moving, I listened. Nothing but silence and my own breathing. I mentally shrugged and turned away from the trees to walk toward the main building. If any werewolves lingered out there, they would show themselves. Or not, depending on their nature and if we'd already been introduced. Several men exited through the main entrance as I stepped onto the porch. Two gave me kind but dispassionate, perhaps even indifferent, nods of greeting. Made it. The other two watched me alertly and nodded politely. Unmade it. I nodded a greeting in return and walked past them, safe with the mated males nearby. Pack law. Protect unmated females from unmated males. Another pack law? Don't place yourself in a situation where you'll be alone with an unmated male, or it could be seen as acceptance of his suit. Inside, further down the long hall that branched from the main entry, more men headed my way. I kicked off my shoes, nodded, and walked past them. Again, a mated male amidst the unmated. You're early, I smiled at Charlene, who walked briskly toward me. He drove fast. Are Paul and Henry around? I haven't seen them, but I'm sure they're around somewhere. I'll see you at breakfast. Charlene didn't slow. She had a pile of clothes in her arms. She seemed more hurried than normal. As a mate to the leader, she tended to be busy, but she usually always made time to talk to me. With a tingle of apprehension, I hurried toward our assigned apartment, the same one we'd first stayed in, but with big improvements. The once sparsely furnished apartment now made a cozy weekend getaway. A plush rug protected the refinished hardwood floors. Pictures decorated the walls, and various knickknacks adorned the room. Just a few of Charlene's efforts to make it homier for those staying here. It also now had a small kitchen, which included a sink, dishes, and mini-fridge. It still lacked appliances for cooking, since we all took meals with the rest of the pack in the comments. The kitchenettes in the apartments were there for private convenience. Sam and I never used ours, but we weren't the only ones who stayed here. Though we had priority on the apartment, I knew visiting mated werewolves used it on our off weekends. Sam had already thrown his bag on the fold-out couch in the living room when I walked through the apartment door. I walked past him, tossed my bag on my own bed, and returned to the living room to watch him and try to puzzle out his mood. The last few informal introductions had been less than typical with an unusually high number of unmated males coming to the compound from greater distances. I figured this one would be no different. Maybe he was worried about the number attending. So, when do we get started? I paced around the room to stretch my legs after the long drive. As soon as you're ready, I guess. Sam riffled through his bag, looking for something. How many this weekend? He didn't look at me. In fact, he seemed to be making an effort not to look at me and had been making that effort since breakfast. My stomach wanted to do a flip, but I firmly smashed down my emotions. 
I needed to figure out what was going on before I reacted in any way. Emotions around werewolves gave you away. They could smell some and hear others. I'm not sure. All of the elders put out a call since it's your last one. Ready? He straightened, with pencil and paper in his hand, and still did not meet my gaze. He kept himself busy by tucking the pencil into the spiral of the notebook as he moved toward the door. Yep. I fell into step behind him. So, what does that mean? That there are more ears than usual. He opened the door for me. A werewolf fun fact to keep in mind at all times, they have excellent hearing. I didn't say anything more. Sam typically stayed very open with me, but something definitely felt different about tonight. I followed him down the hall. Our footfalls echoed softly on the hardwood floor. Despite my effort not to react in any way to the oddities I kept noticing, a tension built inside of me. Not about the introductions. I'd grown used to those. They could throw as many unmated at me as they wanted. I knew it wouldn't work. In the past two years, not once had I felt any physical interest in any werewolf. There'd been some nice ones I'd enjoyed talking to, but nothing more. No spark that Sam had insisted I would feel. He'd stressed that whatever I felt, the male would feel infinitely stronger, a compulsion that they wouldn't be able to deny. No. The tension wasn't about meeting more werewolves. It was Sam. The tension continued to grow as I puzzled over whatever Sam hid, whatever made him act so nervous and guilty at the same time. When we didn't turn to go to the commons, but instead went down the hall I knew housed the infamous introduction room, his odd behavior suddenly made sense. They planned to go old school for my last introduction. Since Sam had stressed a formal introduction could be dangerous to me, his nervousness and guilt were understandable. But I didn't understand why they thought a formal introduction necessary. Did they really think the results would be different? Sam, you should have told me first. He said nothing as he stopped and opened the door at the end of the hall. He motioned me inside. Resigned, I entered. The windowless room had the same comfortable log cabin design as the rest of the compound. However, near the center of the room, ten worn X's taped to the floor formed a gentle arch. A few feet away, a solid line ran from one side of the room to the other, separating the front and back halves of the room. On my half of the room, folding chairs waited along the wall, a place for elders to wait and observe. Having elders present meant disputes were resolved quickly and without bloodshed. It also meant better protection for the female. Each side of the room had a door. According to tradition, five men would enter from the opposite door, which led outside, and remain in the room for five minutes. The elders present would watch my reaction to these men and their reactions to me. Five minutes gave enough time for me to introduce myself to each of them. It seemed pointless to me, though. Through their own admission, true mates would know within a minute of meeting each other. All ten marks came into play during introductions for older, unmated were females. Once introductions started, unmated males traveled from distant states until the Elder Network announced a claim. The males competed aggressively for a mate, since fewer females were available to men. Sam had told me, statistically, the birth rate was about three to one. Some thought it nature's way to keep the werewolf population low. Others disagreed. They argued that it didn't make sense when human females appeared to be evolving to fill in the need. I understood the seriousness of this introduction and stood near the door I'd entered. 
If trouble broke out, I would step through the sturdy, thick door, lock it behind me, and run like hell. The locked door wouldn't slow a determined werewolf. Without an elder standing between an oncoming werewolf and me, I wouldn't stand a chance. Still, locking it would make me feel better once I stood on the other side. Declared a safety zone, I was supposed to remain in the hall beyond to wait until the elders calmed whatever disruption might occur. Although the setting had changed, the rules hadn't. They couldn't force a maid on me. It was up to nature. One more weekend to play it cool, then done. The elders began to enter behind me. During the informal introductions and the commons, two or three elders always remained nearby. If informal introductions called for at least two elders, I knew to expect more for a formal introduction. Definitely three. Maybe four. Sam already sat on a folding chair to my left. Gradually, four more filed in. Four men, including Sam, and one woman. The number surprised me, but I didn't mind the extra eyes. I'd met Nana Winnie two years ago while still learning about introductions. A kind and patient teacher, she'd explained so much to me. Having her here comforted me, and I looked forward to talking to her afterward. Once the last elder sat, the outer door opened and ten men stalked in. Ten? I successfully kept my feelings from my face, but I knew they would smell my confusion. Ten, explained the extra elders. Werewolves in their fur were all powerful and vicious, elders more so because of their position in the pack. In addition to the increased number of elders, the ages of the werewolves who stood on the X's ranged from young to old without restriction. Screw nature. No way would I be even remotely interested in someone old enough to be my father, especially when I had no clue who my father might be. Wanting to get the introduction over with, I stepped forward so the toes of my socks rested just behind my safety line and met the eyes of the first man. I nodded a greeting, turned with military precision, and paced to the next taped X to meet the second man's eyes. I slowly walked down the line and met the eyes of each man I passed. At the last man, I turned around to face all of them. Thank you for coming. They all stepped back from the tape and turned to leave. I stayed on my side of the tape and watched their retreating forms. The door on their side of the room opened so they could file out. It felt weird not learning their names as I usually did in an informal introduction. But I knew this was typical of a formal introduction. Any man interested in me would remain on his taped mark while allowing the others to step back to leave. This would give Sam a moment to note the interested party. Anyone on Sam's list would have an opportunity for a second introduction where I would actually converse with him. The second round had more danger. Movement in the recently vacated doorway broke my chain of thought. The doorway had barely cleared before the next set of ten entered. Was it always this rushed? Breaking protocol, I glanced at Sam. He watched the men, still not looking at me. Without frowning at him like I really wanted to, I turned back to focus on the men who now stood on their marks. In this group, all of them were over forty. I repeated the same process from the first group, acknowledging each of them as I walked past. One appeared to have the start of a black eye. I thanked them for meeting me, and watched one remain on his mark while the rest marched out. The remaining man waited for Sam to make a note, then nodded at me before he turned to leave. Again, ten more filed in as soon as the room emptied. This felt wrong. Two rushed. They weren't even waiting the full five minutes once the men stood on their marks. 
Instead of moving forward toward my line, I put my hands behind my back and kept my eyes on the ground. The rules said that the elders would not interfere unless they perceived danger. They would not speak unless it was imperative to my well-being. It ensured no outside influence to any decision I might make regarding my choice of mate. That rule made it impossible to ask Sam for an explanation and actually get an answer. Why did they change to a formal introduction now? Why, on the last visit? What were they trying to accomplish? The unmated males entered ten at a time and faster than the normal five minutes. I looked at the line on the floor. The crisp tape looked new, even though I'd heard from Henry and Paul. Still, my best sources of information that it hadn't been replaced in years. It looked new because it had never been walked on, never crossed. You leave by the door you enter, that's the rule. I looked up. Rules are meant to be broken. Answers waited beyond the opposite door. Stepping to the line, I met each of the unmated male's eyes. While doing so, I noted dried blood under one man's nose. It's nice to meet you, I said and waited, saying no more. They all stepped back to leave and the door swung open. A moment, please. As one, they stopped before any of them reached the door and turned to look back at me. I could feel the elders watching me, but didn't look at them. I broke protocol, crossed the line, and walked toward the door. Since none of the men acknowledged any interest in me, I hoped I'd be safe enough. Gabby, wait, Sam called. Hearing him stand and follow me caused my stomach to dip. My steps slowed for a heartbeat. Stepping through the door could compromise my well-being. But staying inside wouldn't get me answers. The door beckoned. I stepped through onto a packed dirt path and looked around. The light that spilled from the door illuminated a small area. The trees that crowded the building left only a small gap of about 20 feet between the tree line and the roof line, which cast the area in an early dusk. In the cleared space near the back door, 20 men waited quietly. I frowned, puzzled. Something still felt off. I'd expected to see many more given the rushed introductions. Closing my eyes, I breathed deeply and focused. Tiny sparks flashed around me in the darkness. Sam, I saw, stood to my right. His spark glowed steadily, not blinking at all. The group of twenty was different. Some of the werewolves' lights blinked like strobes, some faster, some slower. Some so slow, I at first thought they might have left. As I studied them, it began to make sense. I wasn't seeing werewolves quickly running all over the place. Rather, an arrhythmic indication of a werewolf's location. I focused beyond the twenty. Lights too numerous to count stood out in the darkness. It would take hours to meet them all. Had all the prior introductions been a farce? A game to keep me from running until Sam could arrange the real thing. How strongly were the elders determined to see me mated? Would they let me leave unmated? Had my thoughts of college been a dream? I struggled with my growing frustration and panic. No, not a dream. I wouldn't give up. I opened my eyes, already knowing that the group of twenty had doubled. I studied their faces and noted more bruising and blood. Some men dressed in jeans and shirts, while others wore clothes too filthy from fighting to identify. Seeing the filth and blood, I understood why they wanted to rush the introductions. Too many werewolves had arrived for this, and the mating challenges the elders feared had begun. I didn't say anything. I couldn't. Anger churned in my stomach at Sam for not telling me. I felt tricked and yet sad for the men waiting. Sam, 
I said, turning my gaze on him. There was nothing playful in my look. I wanted to tell him that I would never forgive him for this, but knew the werewolves listening would take my words as a rejection. They would take away what little hope they had facing these numbers. Instead, I let my look convey everything I felt. He lowered his gaze and broke eye contact, something he never did first. Good. He knew. I turned away and studied the growing crowd. I'd lived among them enough to know not to show intimidation. They respected strength. With their hearing, I didn't need to raise my voice. Even those still hidden within the trees would hear me. No more fighting. There's no need to wait and fight for your place in tonight's introduction. I will meet you all. Start a line here and I'll walk it. If I am not right for you, there is no need for you to remain after I've passed you. You may leave. And know that I am honored by your presence here tonight. Chapter 4 Men silently stepped from the trees and moved to create a line as I'd asked. They continued to emerge from the woods even as the line extended around the corner. Because of that, new rows started behind the first line. The shuffling continued until roughly five hundred gathered. So many men focused on me, all at the same time made my stomach churn. If they were human, I suppressed a shudder at the thought. Ignoring the vast number, I moved toward the first man, nodded stoically, then turned to start the slow walk down the line. The elders kept pace with me. I didn't bother pausing to meet anyone's eyes. Only my scent mattered. As I'd asked, those without a strong interest stepped out of the line and walked back into the woods. It allowed those behind them to move forward and take their place. When I reached the end, I turned around to walk it again. I paced the line several times in silence so all would get their fair chance. As the number remaining decreased, my mood lightened. Sam made note of names as needed. Soon, only a handful of men remained. While my future loomed brighter, theirs dimmed. I nodded solemnly to those remaining and watched them melt back into the trees. I truly felt for them, but I'd experienced no attraction to any of them. No pull that Sam and the other elders and werewolves had assured me I would feel when, not if, I met the one. A triumphant smile wanted to break free, but I contained it, not wanting to offend anyone. Finally, my duty was complete. I breathed deeply of freedom, ready to go back to my room. Behind me, the elders moved, reminding me of their presence. My mood shifted. The anger and betrayal from their lack of warning resurfaced. With a stiff back and a tight mouth, I made my way toward the door and the waiting elders. I didn't meet any of their eyes. Sam had hours during the drive to say something, but hadn't. And now all of his secrecy had been for nothing. I hadn't found a mate. Did he realize the pointlessness of his gesture? I seriously doubted telling me in advance would have changed the outcome other than to make me nervous during the drive up. That, however, would mean I shouldn't be mad at him, so I quickly disregarded the thought. Honesty was honesty. He should have told me. Walking the dirt path, which I realized I'd tread over several times in my socks, I saw a peculiar shadow on the ground melding with the shadow of the still open door. I looked up at the space behind the door and saw the flash of eyes just before a man stepped into view. I froze. My stomach dropped, and my heart did a strange little flip. Before I could take my next breath, a shiver ran up my spine and goose flesh rose on my arms. My anger spiked, uncontrolled. You have got to be kidding, I whispered to myself without thinking. I'd been so 
close to escaping. His filthy, long, dark hair trailed in front of his eyes and shadowed his face into obscurity. An old, dull green army jacket, just as filthy as his hair, hung from his frame while his bare feet shone pale against the black sweats he wore. I couldn't tell his age, the color of his hair or the color of his eyes, because of the tangle of hair, but I could see the glint of them as he moved away from the door. He stalked toward me. I remained frozen and tried to deny the significance of the encounter as my stomach continued to do crazy little flips. Just before he reached me, he turned away and walked around the corner of the building, heading not into the woods as the rest had, but to the front of the building. I stared after him, momentarily confused. He'd recognized me, just as I had him. Why had he turned away? Did it matter? Move! Escape! Before he changed his mind. Finally, my feet obeyed, and I lurched toward the door. Sam, I've more than fulfilled any obligation I had to you or the pack. I'd like to leave tonight. The elders stepped aside before I bowled them over. I rushed past them, through the introduction room, and into the interior hall. There, I paused to pull off my dirt-caked socks. Charlene would have me cleaning floors if I walked through the halls in my filthy socks. Maneuvering through the fortuitously quiet and empty halls, I struggled to control my emotions. Over the years, I'd learned control, knowing those around me would be able to smell things like fear, anger, lust, or even sadness. But tonight... All that control evaporated. Anger and fear swamped me. Anger at Sam for arranging the whole damn thing, and fear that the elders knew what had just happened. I'd been so close to freedom. Sam had set me up, stacking the odds against me with the sheer number of werewolves in attendance. Why would it have to be the very last one I saw that sent a bolt of lightning right into my stomach? Was it too much to ask for just one break in my life? Self-pity began to flood me, but then a spark of hope surfaced. Could it be possible that no one noticed? Maybe they had attributed my reaction to the way he looked. I turned a corner, almost to our rooms. If I didn't acknowledge him in front of others, then it didn't count, right? Once in the apartment, I headed straight to my room and grabbed my bag from the bed. Thankfully, I hadn't unpacked. Moving quickly, I went to Sam's bed and zipped his bag closed just as he walked through the door. His slightly mussed gray hair gave away his agitation. Good. He deserved a little bit of it to match my own. He met my gaze. I resented that he did so now, after the introduction was complete and he'd gotten his way. Now, Gabby, he started in his soothing tone. Stop! I held up a hand to forestall anything else he had to say and to keep my temper in check. He might not know he'd gotten his way. Even if he did know, he didn't deserve the pithy remarks running through my head. He deserved my respect for all he'd done for me in the past and for everything from which he'd shielded me. Still, I wasn't going to listen to any more tonight. Amazingly, he didn't try to continue. Are you driving me or not? I asked as I picked up his bag. He held out his hand. I surrendered the bag and wondered what I'd do once we got home. I still had a whole summer ahead of me, a summer filled with two jobs and roommate interviews. Would Sam still let me leave like I'd planned? I followed him out the door and closed it softly behind me. I knew I couldn't escape this place permanently because of my tie to these people, but I hoped not to see it again for a long while. Sam's easy stride annoyed me within two steps. Was he stalling? 
I took matters in my own hands and strode past him to get to the entrance. The longer we stayed, the more likely I'd run into that guy again. According to the information I'd gleaned over the years, he shouldn't have turned away in the first place. Maybe he hadn't been attracted to me. In the entry, I stuck bare feet into my sneakers, which felt wrong. But I didn't want to waste time to stop and put on socks. A part of the heel folded under and wedged itself behind my foot. I was taking too long. Scalp, prickling with tension, I struggled to pull the crimped back out. Why had I crammed my foot into the stupid thing? I took my shoe off, fixed it, and slipped it back on as my gaze darted around the room searching for any sign of him. Sam had continued his leisurely pace and just stepped into the entry as I tugged on the door. Nerves strung tight, I almost screamed at the sight of someone standing there, illuminated by the yard light. Instead, I only stopped abruptly. Not someone. Many someones crowded the porch. A whole group of werewolves. For that split second, when I'd opened the door, I thought that man had returned for me. The men fortunately didn't notice my near heart attack or me. They were too busy watching something in the parking lot. Standing shoulder to shoulder, they blocked my view. I didn't really care what had them so engrossed. I wanted to go home. I heard Sam behind me, muttered a quick, excuse me, and moved around the small group. It took me less than a second to spot the object of their attention. Once I did, I couldn't look away. Sam's truck had exploded. Okay, maybe not literally, but that's what it looked like at first glance. The detached hood leaned against the right front fender. Dark shapes littered the ground directly in front of the truck. My mouth popped open when I realized I was looking at scattered pieces of the truck's guts. Little pieces. Big pieces. Some covered in sludge. Deep inside, I groaned a desperate denial. Not Sam's truck. I needed it. A clanking sound drew my attention from the carnage to the form bent over the front grill. He did this. The last man I'd met. He studied the gaping hole that had once lovingly cradled an engine, one with enough life to drive me home. Gabby, honey, Sam said from behind me, causing me to jump. I don't think he wants you to go just yet. My heart sank. Not only did the man's actions scream loud and clear, she's mine, but Sam's calm statement confirmed my worst fear. The elders had noticed. My stomach clenched with dread for a moment, and I wrestled with my emotions. No, it didn't matter who noticed. I wasn't giving up or giving in. I'd told Sam I'd come to the introductions. I had never agreed to follow their customs. There's more than one vehicle here, I said. If we go inside to ask anyone else, we'll come back to more vehicular murder. I turned to look at Sam. He watched the man and his truck. He was right. I couldn't ask anyone else to deal with this guy's obvious mental disorder. As soon as that thought entered my mind, I felt a little guilty. I usually didn't judge people. I preferred to avoid them altogether. But this guy made himself hard to ignore. Fine. I shouldered my bag, turned, and walked toward the main gate, pretending I didn't hear Sam's warning. You won't get far, he said softly behind me. The yard light's glow didn't extend under the branches canopied over the compound's dirt road. Crickets sang, and night creatures distantly rustled in the undergrowth. With a hint of anxiety, I marched toward the distinct boundary between light and dark. The dark 
didn't concern me as much as the things hiding within it. But my fear of that grimy man overshadowed any concern I had about crossing over that boundary. Darkness blanketed me. I slowed while my eyes adjusted. I used my other sight to watch for signs of pursuit. None of the sparks from the yard moved to follow me. My fear kept me walking for miles. No werewolves ever entered within the perimeter of my sight, though I thought I spotted a bear. Maybe a werewolf escort wouldn't have been so bad. Hours later, tired beyond imagining and satisfied that Sam's dire predictions had turned out to be false, I spotted a motel ahead. The empty parking lot screamed vacancy better than the creepy, flickering red sign mounted in the office's window. My feet and legs hurt too much to ignore the opportunity to rest. Sighing, I pushed open the office door and rented a room for the night using the emergency cash I always carried. My plan remained simple enough. In the morning, I would find the nearest bus station and buy a ticket home, or as close to home as possible. Key in hand, I walked to my door and let myself in. A damp, musty smell engulfed me. I stretched out a hand and patted the wall until I found the switch. I grimaced at the room. It didn't inspire any thoughts of recently washed sheets. I kicked off my shoes and set them near the door. About an hour into the walk, I'd stopped to put on socks, and as I padded across the dirty carpet toward the bathroom, I was thankful for their protection. The shower curtain looked brand new, but the tub and floor hadn't seen a scrub brush in a long time. I used the toilet, but didn't look at it closely before or after. Sometimes ignorance was bliss. The water dripping from the faucet had stained the porcelain brown, so I let it run while I dug through my bag. My stomach rumbled, and I regretted not grabbing some food before leaving. Ignoring my protesting stomach, I scrubbed my teeth. When the water ran clear, I spit and rinsed, smelling the water too late. Rotten eggs. Instead of wishing for food, I wished I'd just left the toothpaste in my mouth. I wanted to go home, where a clean bed waited where inadvertently swallowing water from the bathroom sink wouldn't put me in the hospital, where I could pretend this weekend never happened. Purposely not thinking of anything but the present, I left the bathroom light on and moved to the main room. I set my bag on a chair, turned off the light, collapsed fully dressed on the bed, and pleaded with the universe that nothing gross contaminated the coverlet. The drama of my day had taken its toll. My eyelids refused to stay open. Grossed out and hungry, my last thoughts were of the creepy guy at the front desk and chaining the motel door. I stretched, only half awake, and fell off the bed. For a queen-sized bed, I must have rolled around on it a lot to work myself so close to the edge. Laughing at myself in the darkness, I pulled myself back up on the mattress and winced at the soreness in my legs. I paused. Darkness? My stomach flipped in fear as I remembered the light I'd left on in the bathroom. I blindly stretched out my arm. There should have been a wall near this side of the bed. The door to my room swung open. Light flooded in, blinding me. A shadow moved to block the light, and I suffered a moment of disoriented panic. Was it the man from the front desk? By my third squinted blink, I saw Sam standing silhouetted by light. Behind him, I spotted his fold-out bed. You okay? He asked. What am I doing here? I turned and looked at my familiar room at the compound. Dunno, he mumbled. He brought you back before dawn. Didn't say a word, just knocked on the door carrying you. I let him in. He set you on your bed, then left. 
Sam's hair stuck up in places, and he absently scratched the hair on his chest, wobbling a bit as he stood in his flannel house pants. He needed his coffee. I looked down at myself. Dirt stained my clothes, as if he'd dragged me all the way back here from the motel, by my feet, through mud. I reached up to comb my fingers through my hair, and a leaf fluttered to the floor. I stared at it in disbelief and let my hands drop back to my sides. He'd left me looking like a wreck. What was going on with this guy? What happened after I left? Did he follow me? I watched Sam closely. If he didn't respond with complete honesty, I wouldn't be responsible for what I said next. Not right away. When you started walking, he looked up from the truck and watched down the road for a while. Long after you passed from sight, anyway. Then, he just took to the woods, leaving my truck in a heap. Apparently, he wouldn't let me go easily. Not that walking half the night had been easy. It also meant he'd left after I'd walked far enough that I could no longer see his spark. He probably tracked me by scent, keeping his distance. Clever. But why? I needed to talk to him and figure out what he wanted. There were probably new rules, his rules that I needed to learn, too. My impotent frustration grew. Better to get it done now so I could figure out a way out of this mess. Where is he? Gabby. Before you do anything else, I'd like two minutes of your time. You need to hear what I have to say. My anger at Sam still lay in a dark, dormant pool inside me. I didn't want to listen to anything he had to say. Some of my anger and frustration collapsed in on itself. As I acknowledged the truth, Sam's dishonesty bothered me, but my brush with freedom. To have it so close and then ripped away in the last few seconds hurt more. Besides, if I didn't hear him out, I'd wonder what he had wanted to tell me. Defeated, I agreed. Fine, but please hurry. Sam turned and walked back to his bed. I followed. His name is Clay. Sam said, sitting on the lumpy mattress. Clayton Michael Law. He looked up at me as I moved closer and eyed me from head to toe. In the brighter light of the living area, I really did look like I'd been dragged, or at least rolled in mud. How had I slept through someone carrying me for miles? He's 25 and completely alone. His mother died when he was young. An accident. Shot by a hunter while she was in her fur. His dad took him to the woods. That meant he'd been raised more wolf than boy. Sam had explained much of the recent pack history to me when we'd first started coming to the compound. They'd only maintained enough of the original buildings to keep up appearances and used the 360 acres that came with it to live as wolves. Charlene's arrival had brought about huge changes, mostly in the social aspect of the pack. Afterward, most pack members started acclimating to their skin. Only a few of the old-school werewolves still preferred their fur. His father died a few years back, Sam continued, pulling me from my own thoughts. Clay's been on his own ever since, still choosing to live in his fur more than his skin. He's quiet and has never been trouble. He comes when an elder calls for him, but still claims no pack as his own. So by pack law, he's considered forlorn. Forlorn. I closed my eyes tiredly and recalled my werewolf history. Prior to Charlene, the decimated numbers had only supported one main pack in Canada and a few packs overseas. 
Over the last two decades, the Canadian PAC had grown enough to consider splitting their numbers. Because of the dangers of discovery, joining a PAC ensured an individual's safety and continuity for the PAC. Some, like Clay, stubbornly remained reclusive. The majority of those who stayed solitary did so because they disagreed with the changes Charlene had helped to establish. Many felt the superiority of the pack entitled them to an elitist isolation from humanity and the world. By staying on his own, Clay had effectively stated his opinion on the pack's re-entry into human society. However, Sam's comment about never being trouble meant Clay had not yet actually sided with the other opinionated Forlorn. Yet, Forlorn, not having a link to a pack, still had the link to the Elders, a link all werewolves shared. Elders acted as the lawmakers and enforcers for all werewolves while the pack leader enforced the rules for the pack, settling disputes. Elders and pack leaders worked hand in hand to keep the pack healthy and growing. Though a pack leader did not control any forlorn, the base society rules laid down by the elders still bound them. According to Sam, a werewolf could not break their society laws. Once an elder declared a law, it became an ingrained piece of the werewolf. Sam had compared it to a hypnotist. The werewolves heard the law, could contemplate it, have opinions about it, but followed the law regardless of their thoughts and feelings. Most laws made sense, and werewolves didn't try to fight them. But even when a werewolf disagreed with a law, there was no choice other than to obey it. At least, no one had proven otherwise. However, I'd overheard Sam speaking with another elder about several instances where a forlorn had ignored certain aspects of their laws, which made the relationship between the pack and forlorn even more strained. Sam sighed and rubbed a hand over his face. He was here last night to help keep the peace. He didn't come to be introduced to you. At least that explained his presence by the door and not in line with the rest of them. My conspiracy theory that Sam had set me up shriveled. There are two things I can promise you. Though he is technically forlorn, he's always followed pack rules. He has no issue with humans. With him, you are safe. His control over the change is unusually strong. When overstimulated, the change could burst upon a werewolf with less than adequate control. Sam had drilled that into me when I first started hanging out with Paul and Henry unsupervised. He didn't want me to freak out if one of them went wolf on me for no reason. He'd stressed that whether in their fur or in their skin, they had the same intelligence and instinct. The change was just a defense mechanism, because in their fur, they had teeth and claws to fight. So, what he meant was Clay had control, and he kept his emotions in check. And he won't give up, Sam added. Clay hadn't been looking for a mate like most werewolves did once they reached puberty. Did that give me any advantage? I doubted it. Sam had repeatedly stressed that instinct ruled this business, and fighting instinct proved extremely difficult for werewolves. So Sam's final warning was a given. Once they scented their mate, they couldn't turn back. I sighed. Why couldn't werewolves get strategically timed head colds like the rest of us? All right. Where is he? I think he's still tinkering with my truck. Try there. Sam slid back under his covers, and I turned off the lights for him before walking out the door. My sock-covered feet, the only thing on me that didn't seem too dirty, muffled the sound of my passing. By the front door, I found my mud-caked shoes and put them on. They hadn't been that dirty when I'd taken them off at the motel. 
I couldn't believe he'd put them back on me before abducting me. Had I really been that tired? Maybe there'd been something wrong with that water. But why were my shoes caked with mud?